Well, I think we'll get started. Thank you for coming. So I'm pleased to be here today with you to speak about the mobility data interoperability principles and to share the stage with my colleagues and co-authors of the principles who are spearheading a seamless, sustainable, and accessible to all multimodal future for mobility. My name is Gretchen Newcomb, and I'm the Director of Partnerships for North American Australasia at Mobility Data. Our goal is to make it so simple and timely to choose and pay for alternative transportation modes that you leave your car home for more and more of your travel needs. And to provide reliable and intuitive travel directions, public agencies, cities, and private companies need shared languages and tools. Mobility data meets that need. In order to realize a sustainable future that enables seamless multimodal mobility, let's look at two key issues that the ecosystem faces and how the promise of interoperability can address these challenges. First, how can public transit systems operate more efficiently and dynamically to respond to traveler needs and market demands? And two, how can we align the ecosystem to rely, realize a vision of sustainable transportation that has the power to lift all of humanity and provide solutions to the climate crisis we are facing? First, let's take a look at public transit. Public transit systems are complex and dynamic to operate. I think we heard that a lot in the last presentation, the plenary station. They have current, and the current state of, tra of transit data systems is that they operate independently. There's many different systems with different vendors, often using different technologies and adhering to different protocols. This bespoke approach makes it very challenging to respond to riders' needs effectively. MDIP co-author Ryan Mahoney of Transit Ops described three options agencies have without interoperability. One is to do nothing. An example is an alert system where the delay out of service of a train or elevator, for instance, doesn't talk to the trip planner. They do nothing. For an ADA traveler, that could be disastrous. It could end their trip right there. Second is manual workarounds. You use people to rekey data from one system to another. Logan, you gave an example of our MPTA having to do that early in the pandemic with real-time occupancy data. Um, they were able to do it because they have a lot of uh, experts in their, in their department, but not all agencies have that option. And another, the third option is middleware, software that simulates interoperability by creating a whole new system that sits between existing system to take data from one format and translate it into another format. Now, it sounds like a decent workaround, but the weight of this option catches up to transit agencies, and it's expensive to build these systems. You need a skilled staff. You also eventually becomes a burden when you have more than 30 systems to manage. If there's actually a break in the flow of data, it's hard to pinpoint whether that came from a legacy vendor system or one of the middleware solution systems in place now. And eventually, you're going to have to staff up a dedicated team to manage these systems. And that effectively diverts money away from what you're supposed to be doing, which is um, providing riders. And that's all to compensate for the lack of interoperability. Yeah. Um, also, data innovation can not only increase ridership and improve traveler experience, but it also can help address societal challenges, and advocates can use the data analytics to inform innovation and planning efforts. But the lack of interoperability hinders these efforts. Um, to leverage the full potential of data, we really need to think about how we are making the data visible, accessible, and uniform across all the transportation impacts. Um, Karina Ricks of FTA uh, shared with me some of the challenges the DOT faces accessing reliable data with a broad enough scope to inform the intersectionalities related to transportation. And her team is looking at the language needed to require grantees to work with vendors to build systems that are accessing technology that supports interoperability. So, if interoperability seems like a no-brainer to you by now, and it's actually simpler and more straightforward to adhere to a set of standards for agencies to interchange data, why is it so rare? 
Vendor lock-in has created toxic relationships in the industry. Transit agencies depend on vendors. Many are legacy vendors that are deeply embedded into operations, and agencies rely on them to build systems that have been historically proprietary to be interoperable. And not all vendors are really that motivated to make those changes. Uh, Logan's department has 75 specialists, but most agencies don't. And he'll give us the perspective from a large agency um, when we start talking. For smaller ones, the person handling this area came up, with oper um, came up from operations, often driving the bus. And um, agency people who deal with vendors need so much more complex skills nowadays um, it, that, than they've had in the past in the procurement process with open data, with legal technology, APIs. So often the issue of interoperability gets framed as a request in RFPs rather than a requirement. It's actually a pretty complex process to do that. So the co-authors of MDIP are visioning a future where all information from any mode of travel can be available in formats where it could fit together like Lego, so that each piece of each mobility system could get information from other modes of transportation. This would provide customers with the best available real-time information about schedules and costs for multimodal tra travel. What, that would be a really wonderful vision for uh, the future of mobility. And that's where the mobility interoperability principles come in. The mobility interoperability initiative is a set of principles to guide the development of standards and technology to enable an interoperable mobility future. This is an initiative that was started by a number of transit agencies and other mobility data users as a framework to guide future standards development. And here are two examples of innovation happening in the ecosystem today that require open standards and interoperability. Interoperability can address many of the operational challenges um, agencies face and is also driving new ideas being explored in the ecosystem. Some sees, I recently went to SUMSI Summit and um, saw a presentation and shared, they shared a vision of an open and universal mobility platform architecture to provide regional MOS solutions. Um, you can see the red um, up on the corner. That is um, all open data begins with the backbone of any mobility platform, which is public transit data. Regional mobility hubs are possible with open source software. And open source software is accessible to all across the entire ecosystem to support innovation in large and small producers and consumers of the data in the public and private sectors. Um, the red lines and plugs represent open standard data formats and APIs. And as you can see, open interoperable data is the conduit for the entire ecosystem. Um, I do have a, a short two-minute um, statement from our partner, Sumsi, and co-author of the principles providing um, a statement about it I'd like to share with you today. Hi, I'm Benjamin de la Peña, and I'm from the Shared Use Mobility Center. We are working to replace car-centric transportation with people-focused shared mobility to fight climate change, promote equity, and strengthen community. We're one of the co-authors of the mobility data interoperability principles because data interoperability is critical to expanding shared mobility. The climate crisis and persistent social, economic, and racial inequality are shaped in no small part by how our roads and streets are designed to prioritize cars over people. Transportation generates 30% of US carbon emissions. So shifting to EVs is necessary, but it will never be enough. More than 35,000 people die each year in road crashes. More of those victims are disproportionately black, indigenous, or people of color. More are elderly and come from low-income communities. Our lowest-income households spend 37 cents of every dollar they earn on transportation. And so we need to give people options beyond the private car. We need more shared mobility. And by shared mobility, we mean all the options that free us from our dependence on cars or using cars for every trip we have to make, from public transit to micromobility, from ride hail to on-demand microtransit, from safe sidewalks to complete streets. Shared mobility systems also include the digital and information systems we use to find, access, and use these services. Two weeks ago, we launched the Shared Mobility 2030 Action Agenda, along with a group of over 50 public, private, and nonprofit organizations that have come together to advance shared mobility. One of the agenda items is to invest and build the foundational technology and information systems that make shared mobility more reliable and available and accessible and easier to use. We can make it easier for households and individuals to use shared mobility when we have working systems that connect information between services and users. 
If our information systems are better connected, people will find it easier to look for and choose options, plan their trips, and connect their rides. Most of our systems are still patchwork and don't work as seamlessly as they should. Our systems are not yet interoperable, not yet. Uh, and we don't have the clear strategies and plans on how we will build and interconnect information systems. Committing to data interoperability through the principles is the most important first step. Thank you. So Jonathan Wade of Denver's Regional Transit District and a co-author of the principles shared RTD's um, work in progress for an integrated multimodal future. This is the, my second example. Um, and this would allow a traveler to look at a handheld device or mobile phone and select a destination, and the software would discover multiple itineraries, then the software could handle the reservation and payments all in one trip. And this is their vision. So let's look at where they're at in the easier up to harder process. Um, in this case, you'll find that the, multi, the multiple mobile um, applications that can offer you a route, the software application can discover the data and um, present an itinerary. This is possible because these applications are using GTFS data that RTD provides in an open standard format to any application that wants to use it. Um, for a slightly more difficult situation, they're looking at a traveler who needs our RTD flex ride. Currently, RTD Trip Planner doesn't handle the discovery for flex rides. This is a capability that they're working on using GTFS flex standard. And a more difficult trip to display involves TNCs like Uber and Lyft. RTD has been working with some of the TNCs to integrate the scheduling and payment into their application and vice versa, and that is a step forward. Finally, at some future time, RTD hopes to enable the traveler to plan a trip from home or a hotel in another city and have all the steps planned out in one step payment. But that would require a number of open standards and interoperability that doesn't yet exist. So there are five principles that the authors at this point have agreed upon that I'm gonna walk through real quickly. The first principle simply defines mobility data and interoperability and essentially says that mobility data should be interoperable. The second principle is that interoperability should be achieved through the use of open standards that are freely available. This third principle asserts that the systems to work well for the users, our customers, that transit agencies and other mobility providers need to have tools to present high quality data in real time. We've heard about that a lot in the last step, last um, plenary session. This fourth principle is a little more subtle. The transit agencies and other mobility providers should be able to select the transportation technology components that best meet their needs. This principle is intended to address scalability. Large and small transit agencies may have very different mobility services, yet can draw from the same set of open standards to use only what they need at that point. So principle five is the customer should expect a privacy to be maintained. So let's briefly discuss stakeholders and expectations of these principles. The stakeholders for transit data include the public, mobility service providers, various types of transportation system managers, managers, technology providers, policy makers, and researchers. All of the stakeholders benefit from a commitment to using open standards. And stakeholder expectations include free and fair access to transit data, data while protecting privacy the development of open standards relevant to transit mobility, well-documented open standards, products consistent with open standards. A key point here is that, for the most part, open standards are developed by the technology user community working together, rather than by individual vendors. This entails a system of governance of the standards that allows the standard to be maintained and also allows for enhancement of the standards over time. So the co-authors of the principles represent a coalition of transit agencies, regular, regulators, researchers, and nonprofit corporate corporations. There are also signatories to the principles, which we invite you to join. And those include a number of transportation technology providers that have advised and initially signed on to these principles. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists now about um, their experiences facing some of these challenges highlighted here and why they co-authored MDIP. We will frame our discussion to today around the five principles of interoperability and open up time at the end for Q&A 
session at the end. Um, so we'll be um, joining me today will be Elizabeth Saul of um, Urban Labs representing Cal ITP. Um, also Carl Freudlin of Mobility Data and Logan Nash of MBTA. And I have a QR code at any point you can scan to go and read more and sign up your, your organization or company up at the end. So thank you, and to launch our conversation, I'd like each panelist to please introduce yourself and share your perspective on interoperability and why it matters to your organization and or the ecosystem. Uh, Carl, would you like to start? Sure, uh, thanks Gretchen. Um, so I'm Carl Fredler, I'm the Director of Product at Mobility Data, and for us, um, I think the, the interoperability project um, and the, the principles that we're talking about today are are a means to getting more passenger data. And that is in our mission. And, and we've seen, you know, we, we, we don't, we're not a policy organization, but we do see where this has, has a strong impact. Um, and and we're, we want to be a part, part of it and support it. So I'm Logan Nash. I'm the Director of Transit Technology at the MBTA, which is the transit agency for the Boston region. We are a very old transit agency. We have the oldest subway in the entire Western Hemisphere in Boston, just to give you a sense. And I think interoperability for us means two things. Number one, it means being able to choose the best tool for the job. We have a lot of old technology. We have a lot of old processes. And I think a lack of interoperability over the past 100 years in technology means that a lot of our staff are dealing with tools that aren't very good, technology that is not very good, technology that we are stuck with because we are unable to move our data out of those legacy systems or make those legacy systems work with newer, better tools. I think the other angle for us has a lot to do with, um, I think some things we're all interested in here, which is rider information. If we want to tell riders about the things we know they care about, detours, diversions, replacement service, skip stops, um, we're not doing that very well right now. It means because it requires us to do a lot of things in a lot of different places. It means that someone at our agency has to say that this service change is happening. We have to be able to communicate. They have to communicate that to sort of a skinny jean type people in the technology department in a way that makes sense. We have to be able to put that in a standard feed um, you know, based on mobility data standards. We have to get that out to Transit App and Google Maps and all these folks so they can communicate it to riders in a way that makes sense. If we're not thinking about interoperability if, across that whole process, we're never going to be able to serve transit riders with better information. Thanks. Elizabeth Saul, Cal ATP. Um, and Cal ATP is really interested in interoperability because it, when we peeled back the onion of why aren't agencies able to produce high quality GTFS, which we asked ourselves for each transit agency in California over and over again, a majority of the reasons why they weren't able to provide certain components to GTFS or why GTFS was consistently delayed was because of a lack of interoperability between their systems. And those, when we peeled back the onion even more and talked to the vendors who were providing those systems, they consistently told us that uh, they needed a, a mandate um, would be really helpful for them to be able to bring to their bosses to prioritize interoperability and that absent a mandate, um, we would not be able to, uh, to, to leverage the development resources that would be uh, consistent with interoperability for those systems. Um, and so here's our mandate. Um, and we, uh, um, and as part of joining the, the, the principles and signing on, you commit to, when you're doing procurement, that you're going to procure in a way that's consistent with the principles. You're gonna procure technology that's interoperable, that requires interoperability. And if we can create a big enough market and show the market demand for interoperability, which is very strong, um, uh, I think that we can help move the needle and help move the vendors who haven't been able to move previously. And I think it'll also really open up the field for new and upcoming vendors um, to be able to come into the space because they'll know exactly what the requirements are for them to participate with their particular technology component in the system. They'll know, oh, my technology component needs to read X and print GTFS in order to fit into all of these signatories systems. And that is a really big um, motivator for them to be able to, that, that, that uh, consistent sort of uh, knowledge um, and guaranteed sort of access to that market is, is really powerful, um, it's really powerful for them. One other thing I would say is that, you know, you know wearing my state of California hat, um, 
the lack of interoperability is really expensive. <laughs> um, and you know, one quote that we get is typically it costs about fifty thousand dollars for per year per per lack per connection problem that you fix with middleware. Um, and that's not including a lot of the staff time that aren't fixed with middleware, and you're paying a state employee to like triple enter schedule data every time it changes, which is quite often now. Um, and so when you multiply that across the 200 to 300 agencies within California, that becomes quite costly. Um, and so we really look at it as a, a necessary value so that when we're investing our very limited, unfortunately, federal transit dollars and transit, that that's money well spent. And um, these are federal tax dollars and state tax dollars that we're using, and we, we want to spend them well, um, not spend them on people doing triple data entry. Like, let's, let's spend them on better things. Good, so you actually started to comment on one of my next things I wanted to talk about as far as from the perspective of smaller agencies. And I wanted to have a discussion that I heard a lot this week about contractual monopolies, walled gardens, and the negative consequences this practice has on innovation. How can we change that culture? Um, a while back, Logan, you had talked about how most tri transportation agencies are small and have limited staff to think much about this, and that they do, in fact, get trapped into toxic relationships with a few large vendors, and they don't have access to their own data or have the ability to shop around. And you mentioned that you thought large agencies like MBTA and our regulatory partners should do what we can to build a more open, less predatory transit marketplace. Can you comment on how you think a large agency and possibly in through policy, we could do something like that. Yeah, those words sound like me. I've been using the phrase toxic relationship more often when it comes to many of our vendors. Um, yeah, I think big agencies, I, I think we have some unique challenges, but I think we, have, we do have some unique strengths um, as well. I think one of them is that we often, we are large enough that we can sometimes sort of brute force our way into creating a standard. Um, you know, I know I've been talking a lot about sort of the early days of the pandemic and the real-time occupancy and crowding data that we were able to publish. Um, I think that one was interesting because occupancy standards existed before the pandemic. Not a lot of folks used them. Um, and we were able to, in pretty short order, sort of use our middleware to rip this data out of our legacy dispatch system, start publishing um, real-time occupancy data sort of according to a data standard that we thought made sense under the new pandemic conditions. So it's kind of slightly hacking the existing occupancy data formats. And then because we have in-house designers, we were able to go and talk to riders, not very easy in a pandemic, but we did it, and sort of figure out how do we want to display this data to, um, to riders. And we sort of control the full stack, right? We're, we're pulling data out of our dispatch system, we're structuring the data sort of based on our interpretation of uh, the GTFS occupancy standards. And then we were able to display that data the way we thought was best on our rider facing systems, our digital screens and so on. And you know, those like three little bowling pin icons, I wanna, you know, it was my former colleague Ingrid Pierre, who's, she's a wonderful designer who's since moved on to other opportunities, but she basically put those together and that has become the kind of de facto way to display occupancy data on transit app and other, and other tools. And I think that was a way that we were able to sort of push the industry forward at a time um, when we were all kind of, that's when we were, what we were all focused on. Um, I think the other thing we can do is, you know, we can model effective contracts, right? We have a big procurement department. We do have staff who like, can like, you know, hold vendors to account on calls. I really liked what you said. It's like, you get the GM of like a tiny bus agency on a call with, you know, some technology vendors, yeah, they're gonna run circles around the GM and that's not like, you know, their fault. Um, but, you know, we don't have that disadvantage. I love being on calls with nasty vendors. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the other thing where I think we encounter some limitations, although we try, is sometimes we just, we can, because of our market power, kind of drag vendors kicking and screaming um, into the future. So with our, for example, our legacy bus dispatch vendor, we've got them to commit to developing an API. Yeah, we'll develop an API. Not only that, and we found that they've had a hard time actually sort of executing that work, but you know what? We have the software engineers to tell them what a good API looks like, and here's how you code an invalid response, and this is what you know a 200 response looks like, and really hold their hands. And I think that's, that's something that very, very few other transit agencies can do, and hopefully that's something that will pay dividends uh, for, other, for our peers. Yeah, Elizabeth, it seems that Cal ITP is playing that role for many of the small transit agencies right now. Would that be correct? 
That's correct. And I, I hope to invite Logan to all of our, our calls with vendors so that he can uh, have nasty calls with vendors. Um, <laughs> bring in the big guns. That, and it's true that they, they consistently cite MBTA as uh, the agency that moves the needle in the industry. And so we really, I mean, really appreciate what you guys have done with so many vendors, um, <laughs> seriously. Um, and, you know, it's payback uh, to the rest of the ecosystem since they are the, the talent black hole. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we do play that role. And I'd say one of the things that we, we struggle with is that actually there aren't a lot of people who understand the intricacies of what needs to actually fit together. Like, what what actually needs to plug into what and transmit what using what protocol, that's not transparent. That's like not written down anywhere. Like that's like something you know because you happen to operate a bus company or it's something because you happen to be a vendor. And not knowing that is a real barrier of entry to the marketplace as well. Um, but also we need to articulate what that is because most, most transit agencies have no idea. And I would say I'm learning something new every day and I can't say that CalITP is the expert on any of these systems because none of them are the exact same and there's so many different options and that um, lack of consistency is, you know, maybe some part of it is necessary, but um, probably not a lot of it and it'd be a lot easier for us to all comprehend how the whole system works together if we had at least consistent terminology, consistent data standards, um, and we would be able to provide a lot better um, services to our various agencies um, if that were the case. Thank you. Um, I'd like to flip the perspective now and Carl ask you a question that we had discussed is how do we make sure the principles don't actually become a barrier to entry for new vendors? Sure. Um, I think I think sort of I have the luxury of not having to deal with vendors. Um, I'm, the, I'm the one up here who, who doesn't doesn't have to uh, have. And, and I think I think that's what I want to get at is that that I think there are a lot of, like, we need to be building towards a, a mindset where we're trying to to further this industry and, and, and we're really, there's a lot more for everyone in this to win by working together than there is by someone trying, like, and, and growing the pie, if you will. Like, it's, it's, there is such a huge opportunity for transit and transit technology at this moment in time. And we have to get this done and so we've got to get people working together to build it up. And, and I think that's where, um, yeah, the, for me, it's, I think, very exciting to see is sort of an opportunity to get people involved. And yes, yeah, sometimes more harshly nudge and sometimes more, more um, collaboratively nudge um, companies to move towards, you know, coming back to their core value of, of serving the passenger and, and, and serving the public who's trying to get around. Um, I think to the to the smaller to the question of you know how do we make sure that these don't become a burden because part of the reason there are so few vendors is because of the environment, especially in the United States or um, the regulatory environment of so many requirements, um, many of them very important, many of them related to equity and 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 other issues, but at the same time it creates a lot of a lot of overhead. So I think for us, um, yeah, it's it's just important to keep. In I think the, the co-authors speak about keeping in the sort of core reasons we're doing this, improving things for you know the the public and and that's what it comes back to and, and having that in, in in the middle will help us be able to make decisions on um, what the actual requirements look like when we come to a point of trying to create an enforcement uh, mechanism for the principles. I want to speak to that too because I think. Ideally, if the mobility data interoperability principles are working correctly, these are going to create competition in a market where it doesn't exist. That so many of the vendors I think that we struggle with now are sort of in an entrenched incumbent position. We, we have to keep working with them because you know, our data, our operations in many cases, our safety critical systems in many cases are locked behind these vendors. And so that's why I really love coming to a summit like this and seeing so many sort of new companies, smaller companies that have great ideas and want to get into this space. And it sort of breaks my heart that the state of the industry, um, especially for large agencies like ours, but you know, agencies of all sizes, is that we aren't able to support enough interoperability to just say, oh, you've got a great new product? Oh, we'd love to try that out. We'd love to do this. We'd love to do that. Because in many cases, that's either only possible with us doing a lot of middleware development, or you doing a lot of middleware development, or or just impossible um, without like 
ripping and replacing a whole bunch of hardware, and that's that's tragic. Um, I'm curious, how many, with a raise of hands, how many people here represented a public sector right now? Okay, and how many people from private sector? Okay, I think it's important to have this conversation because somewhat in MDIP is the elephant in the room is um, private sector and protection of IP. I recently um, gave this presentation to the um, ITSA um, uh, Mobility on Demand Committee, and they had some pretty interesting questions. Um, they wanted to, I think you just answered one of them, which I thought was pretty good, is like, how can you, can you identify any downsides or risks of interoperability? I'm like, well, yeah, competition, that's going to be it. So I think that's a very good downside, but it's a healthy for the market. Um, but also, how do you address regions or companies that have their own systems in place and are reluctant to adopt interoperability and change their bespoke systems? What incentive can you provide? Can anybody tackle that? I think one thing we talk about this, I mean, from my perspective, the, the hope is that the interoperability of systems, having a, a, a CAD AVL system that's interoperable with another system leads essentially to, to more passenger facing data, more GTFS real time. Um, like the, the, these can give them tangible benefits in their, in their products that they're offering to their customers. You know, they can get, get your bus, you know, in, into to, yeah, Apple Maps or Transit or, you know, so that people can see where it is. One of the biggest barriers to selling um, a transit agency your product is the fact that they might have somebody else's products already on their bus or in their system. If you make it really easy to swap that out and reduce the friction, and you think you believe you have a superior product that actually responds to customer needs, then you're in a great advantage by having interoperability. You can say, sub in my system, there's not a lot of friction, it's not gonna cost you like six months, it's not gonna make you lose the ability to operate your system for weeks on end. Um, I don't know anybody who was in San Francisco during the great Muni meltdown when they upgraded their train control system in the early aughts, but it was out of service for months um, because of the lack of interoperability and being able to, um, to move from one system to another. So transit agencies are extremely reluctant to move and these contracts last for extremely long periods of time only because of the friction. And if you reduce that friction, then you're able to sell uh, your product if you believe it's better to more people more easily, more often. So um, we, let's, let's stay on this, this a little bit longer. Um, looking at private sector, how do you address their concern of protecting IP or proprietary technology? We've heard that called a false flag, is it? Um, is, what is the perspective there? Um, and how do we align both the public and private sector to really get behind MDIP? I, I don't want to, yeah, maybe it is a little bit of a false flag, but I also think there's a lot of we're asking, we often ask for a lot of things at once, advo as advocates, as transit agencies. Um, I think we should be clear that interoperability does not mean open source software, right? As a transit agency, as sort of a customer, I really, you know, I'd love if your software was open source, but for the most part, I don't really care how the sausage is made. But I am interested in getting, and I'm not gonna take the sausage analogy further, but I wanna get your <laughs> product, you know, I wanna be able to sort of we want to be able to use your product in a certain way, right? Deliver what you're delivering and deliver it in a way that is standards-based, delivered in a way that we can make work with other systems. The shorthand for this is, you know, any function, what I, we tell vendors is any function that you're giving us in a graphical interface, if you're showing us a dashboard for that, show us an API for that as well. That's not exactly meeting the full spirit of the mobility data interoperability principles. Right? We want things to be spec-based, but man, we are at square zero here with a lot of vendors, and so, I think that is what we're talking about. We're not saying, you know, put your source code on GitHub or anything like that. Um, you know, your intellectual property is your intellectual property, um, but we're just talking about, you know, can you give us this data in a way that is modern and usable and, um, you know, low friction for implementing your product and other products in the future? I would just say that if um, you're selling transit agencies a product where the data about the transit agency for a core function of that transit agency, you consider IP, that's problematic. And that's a practice that does happen and that we'd like to stop. And so I'm gonna say too bad for them on that um, because the, the data about public, public infrastructure 
should be managed by the public entities that manage it, not by not by a vendor. So, so we touched a little bit upon the um, negative consequences of a lack of interoperability. We've also talked about some of the sticking points of it getting fully adopted. I'd like to shift a little to some of the promise of interoperability. Um, could you each share a use case within your organization on how transport data is currently being leveraged to foster social or economic benefits related to accessibility, equity, and climate change? And how MDIP would inform that? We do. Um, I think what excites me about interoperability from this perspective is that um, is some of the flexibility that it gives us. Um, you know, if, if I was talking yesterday about Skate, our mobile bus dispatch app, and I think what uh, you know what's really gratifying about that work is that we are building for internal users, for our road supervisors out in the field, folks who are, you know. They don't use a computer to do their jobs like the rest of us. They didn't come up in a career, you know, like behind sitting at a computer behind a desk. Disproportionately, people of color, when you compare them to the rest of the MBTA staff, it's in some ways it's asking a lot for our vendors to say, oh yeah, we expect you to build interfaces that work for these people who you for whom you've never met and you don't really understand like their perspective. Um, so I think it's it's exciting for us that we were able to build something like Skate um, that meets their needs, right? They tell us how they like to work, they tell us how they do their jobs, and we're able to build something that works for them. But that is really only possible because we had already spent so much time and effort building middle, middleware, getting our data into open formats, building mbta.com as a tool for riders. It was pretty easy to repackage that interoperable open data in a format that was useful for our operations staff as well. And I think, you know, not every agency can um, you know, be building their own bus dispatch app or dashboards or anything like that. But certainly, there's a lot of great vendors out there who do want to serve a particular population, whether that's, you know, bus road supervisors or, uh, you know, people who are blind or low vision but wanting to use the transit system. And, you know, those, we can only, we can only make those, um, we can only, ser we can best serve those particular populations if the data works in a way that, we can adapt it for their particular needs. Um, and so I'm really excited about the possibilities of, as we make our data more interoperable, what we can do for those specific populations. From the state perspective, um, it's really, um, we can only take action on things that we understand, and it's really hard to understand things that are in a zillion different data formats and reported inconsistently, or you have to call somebody and look, like take a snapshot of a, physical notebook page and upload, like this all happens. Like, <laughs> um, so once data becomes um, is standardized, um, you're able to do things like understand where all of the slowdowns are on your system for the entire state of California. A lot of them are in the state highway system. Turns out Caltrans is in charge of the state highway system and can do something about that. And we are, we have a grant program out. So that's a direct, relationship and feedback loop between all of the GTFS real-time data that we've been able to aggregate so far, and we need more of it because a lot of agencies are stuck in a proprietary data format, Cubic, um, and, um, and they are um, not, not providing GTFS real-time at the moment um, feeds, and so we actually don't have that feedback loop for systems that are using that vendor because we don't know that there's a system slowdown there, and they're actually um, not able to see that, that slowdown. Um, a similar thing with even just schedules, just learning about the high capacity, um, high, high quality transit corridors, being able to aggregate all the schedules across there. What I really wish, my next wish list is where's the ridership data? Where's the ridership data that I can lay on top of that so I understand where there are riders and where those riders are being slowed down so that we can take action on things that are targeting the most people or people that, um, that are, are in most in need. Um, and we really see a lot of promise in being able to aggregate up to the state and being able to actually do something about it. And a lot of people uh, working for the state are really excited about these new grant programs that are gonna be based on like real-time feedback of performance um, and, and being able to do something about it. So. Yeah, I think I think on our side, um, it relates back to the building of a community and and people working on all these issues together. Like we're here um, these couple days doing the potential for this to free up people's time for for interoperability, for not having to worry about um, you know how to access 
data building building systems to 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 try and convert data uh, through some proprietary format allows them to come here to things like this and and to spend their time participating and trying to figure out how we're improving this whole ecosystem um, and and moving forward that way. I want to add on to that because I think it's great that we are a community, but it is also hard that we have to work as a community to do what we do to give riders better information. Why does it feel so good to use Uber? Why does it feel so good to use Lyft? Part of the reason is that they control the entire data stack from you know, the driver and the device on, on, in their car all the way through all the sort of the back end information to what you see as a Lyft or an Uber rider on your phone. If Lyft wants to show people like, hey, your you know, driver is taking a detour, they can implement all that themselves. They don't need to work with anyone else to do that. Um, if we, as a transit agency, just one transit agency in one region want to show a transit rider, hey, your bus is being detoured, so many people, so many systems that are in the chain of communication, um, which is why we don't do it, which is why the experience is worse. And from an equity perspective, it stinks that, like, yeah, the more expensive product, the Ubers and the Lyfts of the world are providing a better experience. We're not going to be able to match that. We're not going to be able to exceed that until we start taking interoperability seriously as an industry. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move to uh, something that you brought up, which I thought was really interesting, is um, Karina, when I talked to her, she takes a very long view of, of data. She is looking at transportation interoperability and open source data as a first step for broader understanding of all the intersectionalities. And when I was also at SUMSI, a lot of was talked about were mobility hubs and the development of mobility hubs and that they're not necessarily in um, urban areas, that a lot of their needs are in rural or in places of um, disadvantaged populations and they're finding they're very effective. But that requires knowing where people live and what their socioeconomic status is. That's a level of uh, sophistication of data that needs to start to be looked at to answer some of these questions. Um, and that's what MDIP from that perspective would really help. So when we um, ask this is how do we enforce these principles effectively to begin to lay the groundwork for that type of visibility and impact? I don't think any of us are like on the sort of enforcement side of things, but I get, but I, well, I'll say that like, Ryan Mahoney? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's kind of got that kind of mindset, doesn't he? My, Ryan works with us at the MBTA. Um, I think one thing that's hard about enforcement, and this gets to your barriers as well, is that um, you don't want to add a lot of sort of, you don't want to add a lot of red tape, right? You don't want like, I love our friends at the Federal Transit Administration, and Karina's great, um, but uh, we don't want to add more hurdles to all these like great new, we want more competition, right, in this space. Um, I think the best thing that we can do to, um, in terms of enforcement is focus on standards. Like for step one, it's great to say, yeah, you know, if you can give us a graphical interface, then also give us an API or a CSV export or something like that. Um, but it's a lot easier and I think a lot easier for vendors if there's an existing standard that everyone agrees on like GTFS or GTFS real time or the operational data standards and we can say, this is all listed out. All you gotta, you know, go, go and check, go and check these boxes. That's a little uncontroversial. Um, I think when we fall back to sort of asking vendors to adhere to principles or, you know, give us an API for, for this or that thing, we sort of get trapped into, well, we think we've met this requirement, but, you know, we, we, we might disagree as the customer. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tricky situation, but that's why the work that Mobility Data is doing, developing standards that everyone, vendors, providers, consumers can agree on um, is so important. Yeah, I think on, on our side of mobility data, one thing where we've talked a little bit about um, with the co-authors that um, has been an effective tool on, on, on GBFS, which, which Guillaume talked about this morning, is trying to, to provide some good examples. So providing sample um, procurement language for, for different uh, agencies to make it easy for them to ask for what's going to serve them best. Um, and so that's something I think that we're really interested in exploring um, and, and we're hoping is a future step with the co-authors on this. Right. Um, here's a question I wanted to ask as far as um, having access to your own data across many systems. How important, why is that important to agencies? And can you address the data literacy issues of the users the system serves and how that impacts your operations? Um, I just have a very brief thing to say on that, which is that um, 
if your systems are working together um, and you're not having to constantly troubleshoot why this isn't working with that, then you don't necessarily have to have data literacy in order to use your systems. And in fact, most agencies that I was referring to where the general manager is the only person who's not driving the bus, or maybe he also is the bus driver, um, or she, um, they shouldn't have to have extreme data literacy requirements in order to operate their system. Um, and you know, it's keep it simple when it needs to be simple. Um, and right now, that's not the case. Um, I was on a phone call with um, an agency in Northern California, a medium, small medium agency. Um, they have one person of their staff of like a, less than like five for sure um, that is on the phone for several hours each day with their CAD AVL vendor. That is an hour, that's five hours a week that they should be doing something else. Um, and that guy has a lot of expertise in data now and he shouldn't have to have that. <laughs> yeah. I'll add to that, and I'm sure you've been struck by this, is that um, you know, I didn't grow my career up in sort of a transit operations environment, and every time that I go out into the field and talk to the folks who work, you know, our frontline, our dispatchers, our road supervisors, and so on, they know a lot more about this data than we do in many ways. Um, and actually, I've been blown away by like, how they've made do with some technology that like, <clears throat> is, is pretty awful and like they will you know do these do these workarounds and I think this is what exci is exciting about interoperability is you know freeing up their time um, giving them the flexibility to you know focus on what they you know should be focusing on which is delivering good service and you know how could these folks are doing so much with tools that are so inadequate what could they be doing um, if we're able to give them better tools that truly respond to their needs um, that's an exciting thought well I, I was really interested this week in um I think it's Antoine from the National Access Points. Um, it's Antoine, right? Yes, I thought so. Um, he talked about how you know they have a very centralized system and the regulatory process they have for adherence. While it sounds really attractive, I don't think it would ever work <laughs> in this ecosystem. So I think there's a certain, what I'm hearing is there's a certain push-pull that needs to happen um, and a collaboration with regulatory process, but also create a collaborative community that um, will essentially drive this principle forward and also maybe put some pressure on some of the uh, players that are a little less, less, a little more reluctant to join. Um, with that in mind, um, you know, there's a lot going on right now in, in this field, a lot of growth, um, and there's going to be a lot of money flowing through as we build um, and have opportunities to build out mobility. So what are some of the concrete steps we can take to accelerate the adoption of MDIP at this point? Yeah, let's get into those big contracts. Let's start writing contracts. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I think... I think even I've been finding myself sort of starting to actively seek out um, some of the inv like the contract language for some of our newer investments. Like we're so we're building a new we the MBTA is converting a number of our bus garages to be fully battery electric buses, which is really exciting. Um, you know, we're talking about sort of large scale like 200 bus garages that are going to be fully electric, um, but we are building charge. We have to buy for the first time a charge management system, right? Suddenly that we can't just, hey, pull out any bus you want to run a trip. We've got to say, our, our you know, officials have to say, all right, well, this bus is going to be doing this long piece of work, so this one needs a full charge. This, you know, this bus is going to be doing something shorter, so I'm going to get a bus that maybe only has 70% charge. You need a system to manage all that. And um, I think procurement is so boring, but it's going to be so important here. And to like, you know, dig into some of this contract language. Like we had, when I reviewed our charge management system contract, the initial RFP said, oh, this is going to integrate. You will integrate with Hastas, which happens to be the MBTA's current scheduling software, um, which is all fine and dandy until we decide, you know, 10 years down the line to switch to something else. And we're like, oh my gosh, we need to do a change management order with this charge management system provider. And like, oh, they don't even know how to change this. You know, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be a big mess. So instead, we were able to specify, actually we were able to say, hey, you're going to provide data according to the operational data standards or some other mutually agreed upon format, which you know we haven't fully ironed those out yet, but we'll get there by the time we're buying a battery electric bus charge management system. Um, I think getting into the weeds on that, and I know Cal ITP has been doing a lot with contract language, is going to be the really not fun but really important work that um, I think especially we as 
purchasers of services will need to will need to pursue if we're going to make interoperability happen. I'll echo the the contracts. That's where the the handshake happens is in the contracts, and so um, you can have your name listed as a. A, a sponsor, you can have your name listed as a co-author, but really when it comes down to how you're implementing things, it's uh, making a legal agreement to, to do it, um, and that's how it happens, um, and requiring that you make a legal agreement to happen on the other side of it. Um, and I'll just say that there's things that all of us can do to, to advance this in the room, and what we want to do with the principles is to make sure that people don't have first mover disadvantage. In fact, you have first mover advantage, and we want to reward and incentivize action on this. And so, you know, there are definitely, uh, you know, sponsors of the, the principles in this room. I mean, Ito World and Transit, I'll call you guys out because you guys were really early uh, co signers to them, and I want to give you props for that, and thanks for taking the leap. Um, and what that means is that you guys can also tell your clients, hey, look at this. Um, you know, we're, we think that this is important. We think you should think that this is important too, um, enough to put it in your next procurement. Whether that be us, whether that be somebody else, like this is the way that we're going to all make progress together. Um, so tell your clients about it, tell your vendors about it, um, and commit to, commit to the, the spirit of the principles, even if you, and commit to operating on them, even if you can't necessarily get the authority to uh, put your logo up on the website, which there's lots more entities there that are doing things in the back office that aren't allowed to put their logo there, I will say. Um, and so uh, the, the spirit of the MDIP is larger than what appears online. Um, but yeah, actually take action. You can take action right now. There's procurements happening every week. <laughs> yeah, that would be curious to uh, create an MDIP seal of approval that private sector can brand on their, their, their products. It'd be pretty interesting um, to see if, how, if that could get some momentum. But I am curious um, regarding this language um, issue. Um, I know we actually saw a need within GBFS um, to this exact issue within the, um, the bike share and the shared mobility space, and we wrote um, language that they could use that would require GBFS to be used. I'm curious, is there a resource center or repository currently existing for agencies to access um, language that would support MDIP principles? Soon to come. And I want to call out, uh, I've been really remiss in not calling out Scott Frazier, who's the product manager on this entire effort, and he's really the backbone for, for all of this. He couldn't be here. Um, but he, um, he is happy to assist you with contract language. He is also developing some, um, and working with others, um, and I, I don't actually know who else he's working with, but I know he's working with others uh, to develop sample contract language um, that, that will be posted to the website shortly. Okay. Um, one other comment I wanted to make in a possible question is, again, one of the, uh, the questions that came out in the Mobility on Demand Committee is they asked if there was some form of a private sector template agreement in place um, to address IP concerns in regards to MI MDIP. I have heard rumblings that there is something like that, but I think that brings up another perspective is that similar to your last um, talk where you, Elizabeth, mentioned that one of the strongest things you could do in your process is listen and listen again. I think those conversations need to happen with the private sector um, and get them on board. So I appreciate many of you in the room. Um, I'm about to open up um, to conversation, um, comments, and questions, and I'd really like to hear your input. So does anybody have any questions? We'll bring you a mic. Hi, thank you. Uh, Marshall Davey here from the ARTM, we're the Regional Transportation Authority of Montreal. And uh, thank you for the discussion. This has been dancing around so many topics that we've been dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. I feel like this is my Monday nine to five right here. Um, uh, there was so many moments that I wanted to jump in with questions, so I'm gonna try to wrap it all into one big ramble that ends in a question. Um, uh, it kind of touches on number four here, uh, the principle number four for transit agencies to be able to select the technology that best meets their needs. And I want to tie this in with what we were saying about how, how do we communicate the benefits of creating these benefit uh, these systems to 
say, the managers, the presidents of these agencies, et cetera. Um, sometimes, in my experience, I, uh, I experience some pushback. Say with number four, if you're proposing this to an agency, and they're saying, we're doing great. What are you, we, we won an award, pat ourselves on the back. We don't even see why would we spend money on this. And then even, you know, you're saying it's, it's the, the people who work hands-on with the systems that understand them the best, or it's really through their work experience that they gain this knowledge. There's no manual written for this stuff. So sometimes it comes down to us to communicate this to the presidents, et cetera. And uh, I, I like the answer that um, the panelists from Mobility Data gave where it's kind of like, well, this is so obvious. W w how is this even a question? Like, why would we not want to understand how people are using the network? But I actually receive pushback on that sometimes, and it's hard to communicate it to people. So uh, I guess that the question I'm getting at is, is you know, we're talking about how to communicate the benefits of this. Is there any kind of tools out there or any way, and I kind of, I think I know the answer already, but to sort of communicate the benefits either, you know, sometimes it comes down to financials, purely financials. They want to see a number. If I change, if I put in all this effort to changing our system and we need to show them a dollar value, uh, are there any tools out there that help evaluate the impacts of your system uh, once we implement these things um, generally along those lines, yeah. Yeah, I'll respond to that. Um, first of all, that's new that you think you'd have trouble selling this upstream because the majority of, of transit agencies that I reached out to about, it was almost exactly a year ago, I, I we wrote the admin draft, Scott and I, and we started reaching out to agencies and all of a sudden it like ballooned. Like everybody was like, oh my gosh, yes, not like, giant head nods, <laughs> like, yes, me too. And I'm gonna tell my friends next door at the other agency. Um, and so it really ballooned because people really understood and were head nodding about it. And um, they did have to sell it upstream. Um, we, did, we do have uh, two resources on the website. We have a presentation that you can download and a, a fact sheet. Um, but I would also suggest that, that if you were interested, I think many of the co-authors and uh, including uh, Scott Frazier, our product manager, would be happy to jump on a phone call and, and do a presentation. Um, and you know, we could talk about which personality might work best with, with your leadership, whether it's maybe a Ryan or a Scott. They very, have very different deliveries, <laughs> or a Gretchen. And, uh, um, and well, we can make it happen, so. I wonder, too, it's like, you know, you're a large agency like we are. You know, when you're the general manager who has to be like entering the schedules three times on your own at like a you know ten bus agency, like yeah, you, interoperability that sounds pretty good. I want to pick the best tool for the job, but you know, for larger agencies, but you know, our senior leadership isn't aren't using all that. They don't use our scheduling software. They don't use our dispatch software. But I think what we found effective at the T is they do listen to their senior operations staff, right? Like the you know, the chief of our control center, the chief of bus operations. And what those folks pay attention to is, you know, what are my what are my staff's pain points? What are my staff able to do or not to do? And so I think we've been able to, fo we, I don't talk to our chief of bus operations about interoperability. I talk to our chief of bus operations about when are we going to be able to get you turn by turn directions functionality. And our legacy systems, a lot of these legacy incumbent systems are very limited, don't provide the same kind of, um, high quality tools that I think some, we see some of the newer vendors in the market providing. So I think we've been able to frame it as, let's go down this road so that we can get you some really good turn by turn directions for your bus operators so they're not getting lost during like rail replacement shuttles. They're like, yeah, do that, interoperability, great. Um, that's what we found to be effective. I just wanna say quickly that even, uh, I think for a lot of people, first just trying to say the word interoperability, it's taken me a long time. Um, and then the meaning, uh, for a lot of people, interoperability means something very different to different agencies and different sectors of the industry. So I think that alone is a conversation that needs to happen. Um, we had some questions in the back. Uh, I'm Nere Kajava from Avista. This is really great initiative. Really, really great initiative. And I would like to ask, do you have a roadmap for the next steps? For example, these are the principles, but now the agencies come and ask, which standards should we follow for which purpose? Do you have a way of moving forward? 
Thank you. So I think the question is, what's the roadmap forward for MDIP? Um, well, I think I'll start, and I'd like to get to comments here. Um, I would love to see the signatories double and triple. I'd love to see committees with some of these um, segments of the ecosystem that have concerns coming together and addressing those. Um, and we need that. To start that, we need people to sign on and commit to the process. Um, I would say that we have the handshake agreement, the procurement, um, which I think will be important next step. The other thing is the actually specifying the data standards and figuring out which ones are important, which ones are missing. Um, Scott's gone through a process of articulating what we call in a shorthand the mobility dataverse of, of data standards and APIs. And we're trying to list out what are all of them and do which ones actually qualify as an open standard. Like, does it meet our bar for being an open standard? Which you should look at the definition. We spent a long time on what is the definition that we care about of an open standard. And it is very, you, it was painstakingly reviewed and <laughs> re-reviewed and re-reviewed and uh, still open to feedback, you know? But um, uh, so we want to be able to make sure that people can have a menu of options. If I'm a, a CAD AVL provider and I need to know what I need to input and what I need to output, you need to tell me what that is. You can't just say output GTFS and then uh, what do I do on the other end? Um, well, we have something that Scott, again, amazing man, um, is uh, leading called the Operational Data Standard, um, which is an interchange format between scheduling systems and CAD AVL systems. And that was identified as a major pain point again and again and again at Cal ITP, which is why we started that initiative. Uh, but we want to know where the other pain points are. We need a pipeline of where those pain points are and where we need to come together as a community for open data standards. The other thing that I you know, would love feedback on and ideas, because I don't, I don't have the perfect idea certainly on this, is so we're generating all these open data standards. Where do they live? And now I'm going to pass the microphone to Carl. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, no, and I think I think it's it's a really important question, and it's it's how do we have resources to work on all this? Right now, it's really everyone involved in this is volunteering time um, and taking you know capacity away from other projects that they, that they're working on because we all think it's a net benefit. We all think it's moving towards towards our organizational goals, but maybe something more explicit is is something that we should you know be seeking out. How does this have a sustainable you know, business model behind it. Um, and again, with all the various standards, you know, what does that look like? Taylor, I see you have a question. Uh, Taylor with the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. So what are our goals here? Our goals are to help people move around and help people get out of cars, right? Um, this is the mobility data interoperability principles not just the public transit data interoperability principles. And so I'd like to talk about sort of our enemy here, cars, car traffic, and the data describing that. Um, I think one of the big values of interoperability is the ability to promote right, competition in the market, drive down prices, and right now there are all of these different companies providing traffic data, but I don't think they're in competition with each other as much as they could be. Uh, and so I'd love to hear what you are thinking, what you think about when you think about traffic data um, and I suppose where you think it could go. Uh, thank you. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's a great question and I think a lot about how the, the, the interoperability of cars as a system or flights as a system, uh, I previously worked in the travel industry and it's, it's we take for granted how easy it is to shop for, for flights, for instance. It is so easy in this whole world. Um, there are some exceptions, but like uh, there's been a lot of a lot of work there done, and and not all of it is is you know has the sort of principles of openness behind it that that maybe um, a lot of people who are here to here believe in. But um, it's it's done, and and we have to build something that is you know providing that quality of service. And so I think coming back to looking at like, what are we trying to get done here? We're trying to make it easier for people to get around. Um, and, and if this is the easiest way, then this is the way that they'll be getting around. It's, if it's the way that serves them best. Um, and so everything we can do through this process to make that a more streamlined user experience is, is just incredibly valuable in my mind. Yeah, actually kind of, in some ways it's, it's good that the 
data that exists right now for, you know, just like driving information for drivers is, is so high quality, right? Because I mean, what we want is to, for people, people to be able to sort of compare the trade-offs. All right, am I going to drive? Am I going to take transit? How much is it going to cost? What's gas, you know, what are gas prices like? What's traffic like? And I think in some ways we'd be in a worse position in promoting sort of non-car modes of transportation if we didn't have traffic information, if you couldn't see how, how expensive gas is, because traffic is usually bad. Gas is expensive. Transit is cheap, relatively speaking. Uh, you know, but we need, to, we need to make sure that we're getting our own data out there. And I say transit, I'm a transit agency, but also you know, other kinds of shared use mobility. Um, but yeah, you know, I wonder too if there's things we can learn from what the auto industry is already doing. Small thing to add. Uh, first of all, Carl is, I repeatedly co quote Carl when he says, transit is cheap, we just need to let people know about it. Um, and really, we want to advertise uh, the fact that you can make many, we've done so much work on our transit systems, and so many agencies have done so much work in like modernizing, modernizing the T, not an easy task. Like, <laughs> um, um, but that only matters if people know about it. And it only matters that you know that it's cheap for you to actually use your public transit system if you know about it and are able to compare it to your personal use. So um, I'd say our priority is get, getting that information in front, of, in front of consumers. And I just, as a point of history, the principles a year ago were called the public transit interoperability principles and expanded as uh, people like Benji got involved and I think, which was good. And we, also involved a lot of other stakeholders, like Seattle DOT would be a good example, um, who were like, oh, well, does this also include, you know, TNC information, all these other things. And so we sort of like capped it at like, you know, some scope of like mass, <laughs> um, including public transit, um, just for the sake of needing to put a ring around it somewhere. Um, uh, but those, those lines, I think, are dotted. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, from the mobility, um, perspective, we work at Mobility Data on creating the mapping and the relationships with the different standard bodies within mobility. But I think what um, you got to tailor is the need to do that even farther. And um, recently I was um, contacted by Covesa, which is the rebranded of Geneva Alliance, and that is a similar to Mobility Data, but for the automaker. Um, and with the software-defined vehicle becoming more and more integrated into smart cities um, and will be impacting travel decisions, hopefully they're more shared as autonomous vehicles um, become the alternative for shared vehicles, um, but they, and they'll have less and less of the single-use vehicles, but they're gonna be out there and part of the ecosystem as well. They're also gonna be impacting things like electrification grids. Um, they're gonna be impacting what our infrastructure is for that, how we manage electrification within cities. How does this impact what we're doing in mobility? This is another broader issue, I think, why interoperability needs to be resolved now. So I think when the responses I heard just now were a lot about sort of user-facing data, right? Trip planning, how do we show people that um, transit's just as good, just as cheap as driving. But I'm actually thinking more from the perspective of a city or a city planner. And the great value of this data from their perspective is that it lets them make informed decisions about where can we replace uh, parking with a bike lane? Where can we replace a highway with a bus rapid transit system. Um, and in order to build, and, and we at ITDP are looking at how can we build the tools that cities can use to make these decisions, and those tools need to run on interoperable data around the entire world. Um, and they need to run on interoperable data, not only for transit and bicycling, but for all modes, including walking and driving. I, Taylor, I completely agree. In fact, one of the, the analyses for policy that uh, uh, Tiffany and our uh, Cal ATP team just completed was a competitiveness index between automobile and transit times. And the hard, it was very easy for us to understand how fast the buses were going and very difficult for her to figure out uh, how fast the cars were moving. Um, so I agree with that. Uh, Gislain, Fabrique de Mobilité in France, from Mob. Uh, my question is about interoperability and why <laughs> Why has it been so difficult to achieve interoperability uh, in our industry, mobility, and most specifically transit? Uh, and is it related to the fact that 
In other industries like finance, for instance, there, are, there is more money flowing in this industry and interoperability has been the rule of the game for years because you have no transactions if you don't achieve this. That's true in telecommunication, for instance, also. Or is it related also to the fact that mobility and transport are organized very locally by local authorities or regional, at the regional level and local level, not national level, compared to the car industry with roads usually, uh, maybe not in the US, but usually it's uh, at least federal or like a state, uh, whereas for transit it's more local like the city or metropolitan area. How do you feel about this and what's about your own culture and your agencies? Uh, do you have legacy systems with very specific uh, developments on IT systems? Or did you, have you managed to build like a sound basis for inter interoperability and standards uh, along the years? Thanks. Great, thank you. So, so I think the question is around why is, why is interoperability not as far in, in transit as it is in, in some other areas? Um, yeah. I think it's actually, you know, I was thinking again about like the question of like, the earlier question of like data for, is it, it t Taylor? The, the question of like data for analysis. And I think you mentioned localism as kind of one of the, the challenges. I think that's a big one because actually this is still true for most highway data is that where planning happens, it happens at best, at least in the US at the regional level, maybe the state level. The national level, I mean, USDOT is a grant-making body. They give out money, and as long as you spend the money and don't make a mess, that's fine. Um, but like, and I think the only reason that we have gotten as far as we have with interoperability in transit is because we now have the pressures of sort of rider-facing trip planning tools, and that you have, you know, Google Maps and you know, Transit, comma the app, and Apple Maps, who are you know, sort of pulling for standard data and talking about data quality. That pressure actually doesn't really exist for like sort of highway planning data, for example. Like I think it's really an uphill battle. I suspect even at like the statewide level to say like, hey, yeah, we want to do some national analysis, let alone international analysis of like, you know, highway travel data because traditionally that data has only really been used at these really local, local levels. So actually as bad as we have it in the transit world, I think it could also be, it could also be worse than it is. So we have time for one or two more questions. Anybody have any other questions or comments they'd like to add to the conversation? Hi, I'm Aston from Google. Um, I'm just putting myself in the vendor's shoes. Um, I, I think of this in like terms of like sticks and carrots. So I think um, I've heard a lot of sticks. Like I'm, I'm picturing Logan on a call with some nasty vendors, you know, beating them with the, them with a the stick. And I think you know it, that that'd probably be enough to get vendors to start adopting some of these, these principles. Um, but on the carrot side of things, are there any, um, any carrots that you could offer vendors so that they would be part of this more willingly? No, we do have, we have some really good carrots at the end, BTA. It's called money. Um, you know, we pay some of these vendors, you know, sometimes over a million dollars a year to provide these services. And, uh, and the price keeps going up, I think, because of these incumbency advantages. Um, so I, I, I think the other, the sort of carrot slash stick that I'll offer is that, you know, as hard as it is, someday we will replace these legacy systems, right? And when we break free of, you know, these ancient contracts from the 80s and so on, we're not going back to the vendors that weren't adhering to these principles, right? We're not going back to vendors who, you know, sort of wouldn't kind of walk with us into the future here. Like, um, you know, one way or another, we're going to get to this interoperable future. We're going to spend our money with vendors who are going to, you know, give our staff the tools that they deserve and give us the flexibility we need, you know. So are you coming with us or not? And as much, as many carrots as you guys have over in Boston. We have even more carrots in California. It's the, the, the salad basket of the world. Um, and so... <laughs> We have a lot of carrots that we want to hand out to vendors that are that are meeting these standards. Um, and so, I, yeah, come join us. Um, I would also say that um, something we heard consistently from vendors when we talked to them, because this, you will notice there are a lot of vendors on here, even vendors you would not expect to be on there. Why are they on there? Good question. Glad you asked. Um, 
so they are on there because they don't want, there is a first mover disadvantage. They don't want to be the only ones hanging out there offering something. Um, they are also on there because they know that um, they need to move this way. They know that they want to move that way. They know that they want to look like they move that way. But um, they, they are also on there because um, because they, uh, what was I going to say? There was another reason. Shoot. Um, they're also, but we, we talked to them, and I think that in the earlier session, I talked with, you know, about having these conversations with the developers, and the developers want to prioritize these features. The reason why there's, but they're often scoped out of the project because they're evaluated in procurements based on cost in many cases, not necessarily based on that. And those extra things are considered bells and whistles that are not essential providing for providing the essential duties of the, of the procurement. So if you add it as a basic requirement of the procurement, then you are able to actually say, okay, we're competing on a level playing field here. Like everybody who's, who's submitted a qualified bid um, to, to provide this service, provide this county veil system, provide this scheduling system, is going to have to also develop these things. And the quicker you can do it, um, the more procurements you're gonna be able to participate in and pay down that investment that you've made on interoperability. Um, I wanted to add a moment and put my North American hat on for um, partnerships. And I've been working very close with the DOT and they have one very big carrot coming down the pike as far as um, all the funds they're about to put into the infrastructure and transportation. Um, and I think that we are in a very unique moment in time to use the MDIP principles to leverage change as that money starts flowing. I think that's why it's really important for people to get on board now, understand it, and be able to use that as a tool for change um, as this money begins to flow. I know that Karina is very motivated to do that, so I think the industry needs to get aligned with her. Um, so I've, I've, I think we're going to wrap up now. Sorry, Absolutely. Like, we're not trying to shortchange vendors here at all. Like We want to pay good money for good work. And that's all we're trying to do is make sure that the work that we're doing and elevate the standard, there's money to spend on these products. And we just want to spend our money on, on one thing once instead of on that, that middleware integration 10 times. So I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, this next stage in the industry's growth shows great promise, but needs to be managed collaboratively in order to scale a holistic robust ecosystem that provides reliable, equitable, and green transportation solutions easily accessed by all travelers across the socioeconomic spectrum. At Mobility Data, we believe in the power of consensus building. And to use an analogy, when the tide rolls in, all boats rise. And open source multimodal mobility is heralding in a veritable tidal wave of transformation. And to ride this wave, the mobility industry needs to embrace open data and interoperability to empower stakeholders to create consensus and encourage collaboration within an increasingly competitive and complex environment. And admittedly, that can cause friction. Um, the MDIP, state, um, MDIP principles is an important step towards this future, and I hope that you will join us um, on the principles. So thank you very much for coming, and I'd like to thank my... Um, panelists for a really great conversation.